free speech is under fire on college campuses in America, a federal judge was shouted down and heckled during his speech at Stanford Law School, and it was caught on camera. Well, the judge has described the incident as a bizarre therapy session from hell. Brody Carter has the story. You've invited me to speak here, and I'm being heckled nonstop. Yeah. And I'm just asking for an administrator to sign the That's an An invitation for Federal Circuit Court Judge Kyle Duncan to speak at Stanford University about COVID, Twitter, and guns instead ended up in a free-for-all. Your advocacy, your opinions from the bench land as absolute disenfranchisement of their rights so, and does land. <laughs> One of the more surprising moments came as the law school's associate dean of diversity and inclusion joined in heckling the judge. Judge Duncan describes the incident as a bizarre therapy session from hell. While the judge and others have called for the associate dean's removal, both the law school's dean and the university president apologized, which led to another student protest. This time inside the law dean's classroom, their message is seen on these signs. Counter speech is free speech. Now, of course, protesters are always able to peacefully protest other places on campus. But when you are in a speaking event, it's effectively a closed forum and you cannot be uh, shouting someone down and just saying, as the protesters here are doing, uh, that it's just counter speech. It's censorship. Alex Morley with Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression calls the incident concerning and worries about the future of free speech in America. Free speech is not a right-wing value or a leftist value. It's not something that one side or another, one religion or another can claim. It's something that belongs to all of us uh, and that we can use as a tool to work together uh, to see the changes that we want to see in society, to advocate for them. Prior to the judge's appearance, Associate Dean of DEI, Tyrion Steinbach, sent this email to Stanford students, which states, Duncan has repeatedly threatened health care and marginalized minority communities. However, this threat to free speech on college campuses is not an isolated event. Last March, future attorneys at Yale disrupted a panel, ironically discussing a case on free speech, shouting down Alliance Defending Freedom CEO Kristen Wagner. They were pounding on the walls, blocking the exits, um, and disrupting the event throughout. It, it was very unfortunate and alarming and volatile. We want people to understand that free speech is something that can work for them, whatever their values are. Uh, my specialty on college campuses, we are working hard to get students, you know, students on college campuses in many ways are, are some of our future leaders, and we want right. them to bring those values into, uh, into society when they graduate. Brody Carter, CBN News. This is oddly reminding me of struggle sessions and the revolutions of, of China, where they would literally uh, hang placards over people's head and then just shout at them. Uh, and it was, it was led primarily out of their campuses too. This, this isn't new in, in, in intellectual life, but it has been a spark point for a continued debate about the real value of free speech. And that real value is in the, in the marketplace of ideas where everyone has the freedom to express their ideas without fear of intimidation, without fear of being shouted down. And in that marketplace of ideas, the best ideas always emerge. It's as, as old as the philosophy of synthesis, where you have a thesis and antithesis, and then you find synthesis. And it just seems to work better that way, where you have free and open society. We don't want to have a cultural revolution. It's just, it's, it's not. These struggle sessions aren't going to do anybody any good. If you want to advance an agenda, just speak clearly and, and, and have that right without the fear of intimidation and while, without somebody just trying to shout you down and eliminate your voice. The tremendous irony here is that you have a dean of inclusion trying to exclude a speaker, and that happening in a law school environment where everybody should already be schooled on a wonderful Supreme Court ruling regarding free speech in America. 
It had to do with the Nazi Party. If you can imagine the Nazi Party trying to have a march in Illinois, that's the case. The Supreme Court said even extremely offensive speech speech that seems to be designed to trigger reactions and even trigger violent reactions. If you have uh, the right to have that speech, that's the whole freedom of speech that is guaranteed in our Bill of Rights. So the Supreme Court said, yes, you have to let the Nazis march and carry their placards and uh, have their moment uh, on the main street of a, a public, uh, on a public street. So in this kind of environment, can we please return to that? Even offensive speech has a right to be heard, and it's in the competition of ideas that we get to the best result. In other news, the Southern Baptist Convention has reignited an age-old controversy involving women and their leadership roles in the church. John Jessup has that story from the CBN Newsroom. John? That is right, Gordon. The SBC, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, recently expelled several Southern Baptist churches, including Saddleback Church, for having women as pastors. As CBN's Charlene Aaron reports, church leaders have differing opinions on the issue. The denomination's executive committee cited Saddleback Church of former pastor Rick Warren for having a female teaching pastor functioning in the office of pastor. That's a reference to Stacy Wood, wife of the church's lead pastor, Andy Wood. It's an issue that's led to much discussion from both supporters of women preachers and those opposed. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at age seven in an old-fashioned tent revival. I preached my first message at nine in youth service. At age 30, Sharon Hardy Knotts of Baltimore's Faith Tabernacle was ordained into the ministry. For years, she preached on Christian radio with her late father, R.G. Hardy. She recently shared on CBN's prayer link about the time she got booted off the air because she was a woman. We were on these stations a good full two years, and then one day my uh, radio representative called me and said, uh, Sharon, I got bad news for you. She says they want to take you off the air because they do not believe in women in the pulpit. It's a view held by many in the church, including Pastor John MacArthur of California's Grace Community Church, who points to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to back up his belief. It's in verse 35. The last part of the verse, it is improper for a woman to speak in church. That's not ambiguous. That's not at all unclear. It is improper for a woman to speak in church. That is an absolute prohibition. Pastor Joel Rainey's Southern Baptist Covenant Church in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, agrees that women should not lead congregations. First Timothy 2 and 3 put uh, very clear limits on certain offices, more particularly the office of pastor. We believe that that's limited to scripturally qualified men. Pastor Rainey does believe, however, the Bible supports the call of women to preach and serve in other roles. They proclaimed the resurrection. They were deacons and ministers of various kinds. They mentored and developed other leaders, including other young men. And on occasion, they preached to the gathered congregation. The SBC controversy began in 2021, when former Saddleback pastor Rick Warren ordained three women as pastors. During a recent podcast with Russell Moore, editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, Warren admitted that he, too, once thought the office of pastor was off-limits to women. I had to repent when I actually looked at the Great Commission. Hmm. I had to say, it's not just for ordained men. It's for everybody. At Pentecost, we know women were in the upper room. We know women were filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. We know that women were preaching in languages that other people couldn't hear to a mixed audience. We know women, it wasn't just men. Meanwhile, Pastor Sharon, who took the helm after the passing of her father, says while the controversy over female pastors and ministers continues, she remains focused and faithful. The anointing speaks for itself. And so I just continue to um, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord and doing whatever my hands find to do with all of my heart and trying to do it in humility. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. 
Thank you for that report, Charlene. Well, turning overseas, one of the biggest needs in Turkey after those devastating earthquakes is reliable medical medical care as hundreds of thousands were injured and medical centers were destroyed. That's where Franklin Graham's International Disaster Relief Organization, Samaritan's Purse, stepped in to help. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Hatay, Turkey. After two massive earthquakes shook Turkey on February 6th, Samaritan's Purse deployed one of its state-of-the-art field hospitals to the hardest hit area. In a disaster of this magnitude, time is of the essence. Within days, this hospital was on its way here to Hatay, Turkey, set up in less than 36 hours and one week after the earthquake, fully operational. I like to say it's like we fly with a city. Everything that we bring on our plane, we're ready to go and when we hit the ground. We bring everything we need. The only thing we really need is some sort of water and diesel. And if we don't have diesel, we know how to make it. And our goal is to set up within 24 to 72 hours max. This is going to be our ICU step-down unit. Media relations specialist Stephen Sneed set the scene for CBN News. It's always amazing to see an empty parking lot turn into a life-saving facility such as our emergency field hospital. Sneed says the hospital has served over a thousand patients. We've seen patients really across the board, so men, women, children. We've also seen people with infections. During the initial earthquake, uh, a lot of people were wounded and injured, and with a lack of proper health care, there's been no way for them to really receive treatment in a timely manner. The field hospital is set up next to an 1,100-bed facility put out of commission by the quake. This was the main health care facility for this region, and now that it's no longer operable, we're really treating all of the needs from a health care perspective that exist. And so whether that's high blood pressure issues, whether it's respiratory issues, people not having access to their medications now that their homes have been destroyed. Um, so across the board, we're just seeing everything. The hospital provides 52 beds, four ICU units. It also includes an ER, pharmacy, lab, and operating rooms all run by a team of nurses, support staff, and doctors like emergency room physician, Dr. Chris Brandenburg. For us, it's, um, it's been a blessing to be here helping these people. They've been extremely appreciative to us. You know, I'm thankful for Samaritan's Purse and all that they're doing, you know, to treat these people. Because it's a, when you talk about being a time of need for medical and trauma care, you, you're not going to get bigger than this. They're providing medical care for patients like Hidayat Ok and Yusuf Khan. They helped me a lot. I've never seen treatment like this before, so I feel really revived. We have to thank all these people, this organization and the hospital. President and CEO Franklin Graham came to visit the facility. What it does for your, for your heart to see uh, this team that's come from around the world, uh, that's assembled doctors and nurses in Jesus' name, and to be able to, to help the people of Turkey. And we're so grateful uh, for the help of the Turkish government and all the agencies here in Turkey have been incredible to work with. All the staff and facilities have one purpose. A great opportunity to serve people that are hurting, and bring in some hope and healing. Graham says it's important to pray for the people of Turkey. Well, they're suffering. Uh, it's still cold at night. They're suffering. And just pray that God would uh, allow us and the others to, to be able to reach them and help them uh, to save life. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, at Samaritan's Purse Field Hospital, Hatay, Turkey. Thank you, Chris. Gordon, in the midst of so much suffering and hurting, it's good to see these organi organizations step in to offer help. Well, absolutely. It's wonderful to see. Congratulations to Franklin Graham. Congratulations to everyone at Samaritan's Purse, all the volunteer doctors, all the staff members, the incredible planning. Uh, and the, the strategy to bring uh, the, the most needed aid to that earthquake uh, area is absolutely incredible what they're doing. The medical need is absolutely enormous, whether it's orthopedic surgeries or just the breakdown of the provision of normal medical care. And to have a field hospital set up right in the middle of the earthquake zone uh, congratulations to them. Let's all get behind what Franklin and what Samaritan's Purse are doing. Well, Ireland was once known as one of the most Christian countries in the world. Yet today, few people there attend church. Now a whole new generation of missionaries is rising up to bring the gospel back to the Emerald Isle. Dale Hurd reports from Dublin on Ireland's ongoing Christian legacy. 
If there were a symbol of what happened to faith in Ireland, it might be this, the Church of the Annunciation just outside of Dublin. It used to be one of the largest church buildings in all Ireland, but it's been demolished because so few people attended services. Anyone over 50 in Ireland can still remember a nation where almost everyone went to church, but today live in a nation where in some areas almost no one goes to church. The Christian faith that has dominated Ireland for centuries died with surprising speed. And as one leader put it, today for the Irish, God has become irrelevant. They not only walked away from the church, they legalized same-sex marriage, abortion, and elected an openly gay prime minister. Nick Park heads Ireland's Evangelical Alliance. It was very much a cultural religion. Well, they were Catholic because they were Irish, and the two were seen as synonymous. We were very arrogant as a church. Patty Monaghan helps lead the Evangelical Catholic Initiative. Uh, sadly, it's taken the two referendums uh, that we both that lost, one on same-sex marriage, one on abortion, to bring home to the Catholic Church in Ireland that they're now a minority church. Church buildings abandoned, some Catholic seminaries almost empty. One clergyman wrote that the battle for faith in Ireland has been lost. But a new church is rising. This is the largest church in Ireland, and it is Romanian Pentecostal. The worshippers at Batania or Bethany Church came to Ireland to find work, but now realize they were sent to Ireland as missionaries. Batania Church is exploding and is worshipping in a new $8 million facility. I talked to two of the pastors while the building was under construction. We're praying for this country, we're fasting for this country, and I think God has a plan with us to be a blessing for this country and more people to know God and to be saved in this country. Because God loves Ireland. We realized God has a greater plan, a bigger purpose for our lives to deliver his message and his kingdom works for this country. Betel, another Romanian Pentecostal church, is also among the largest churches in Ireland. Batania Pastor Georgia remembers when nations like Ireland sent Bibles to communist Romania. And those Bibles are coming back now. African churches are also growing. The Nigerian Redeemed Christian Church of God has grown to more than 100 churches in Ireland with several thousand members. And even though most Irish have rejected the institutional church, polls show many still believe the core of the gospel. Among Irish youth, uh, I think it's something like 70% of them said they really believed Jesus rose from the dead. They really believed in heaven and hell. They really believed that Jesus was the incarnate Son of God. So you've still got these very high rates of belief in the facts of the gospel. When we were choked by religion uh, and institutionalism, there wasn't much life. But now that we have those institutions crumbling, I think that we're in the land of opportunity. Monaghan says the spirit is moving in some Catholic churches as well. I do know there's, there's a spiritual awakening happening in this country. And some parish priests are really becoming born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and getting a vision for what's possible. There's that spiritual heritage within this nation that I believe the enemy, Satan, wants to destroy. But there's, I, I believe it's going to happen again. Ireland, once a mission field, then a base for missions, has become a mission field again. So we are seeing such an explosion of, of Christianity, but I believe the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And Ireland still has a call to be a missionary sending nation. And I believe Ireland will fulfill that role again. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Dublin. I believe it too. Ireland has a call as a nation and that call goes back to St. Patrick. Uh, you know, little boy come over and preach the gospel to us. So does Ireland need missionaries again? Yes. And let's recognize it was Irish missionaries uh, that kept the gospel during the dark ages. And they went to an island off the coast of uh, Scotland called Iona and from there sent missionaries back to Europe in order to preach the gospel in the, in the darkest times for Christianity. Let's keep this hope alive that, that God wants to bless Ireland 
and he's, he's left himself a witness there. But what's the fundamental problem? It's the fundamental problem of, of any time the church becomes an institution as opposed to a place of people who have been transformed by a living God into a new creation. If you think going up to the front and shaking the pastor's hand is, you know, is somehow going to make you Christian and just reciting the words, all you're doing is, is joining a club. It's when Jesus becomes part of you, that transformation, what he said to Nicodemus, that you are reborn, you are regenerated from your innermost being. That encounter is crucial to your own Christianity. It's also crucial to a whole society. So let's pray for Ireland. While we're at it, why don't we pray for America? Why don't we pray for New England? New England used to be the bastion of Christianity in America. Same thing is happening where the churches are empty and the whole culture doesn't go to church on Sunday. Why is that? Uh, what, have they lost the transformation that happens when you become a believer? So let's pray for that. Uh, let's not mourn the loss of culture. Let's pray for God's spirit. Let's pray for his presence to come and transform people and save them for all eternity. He's known as the patron saint of Ireland. And today, people around the world are toasting St. Patrick with parades and parties. Yet centuries ago, the celebration was a little different. Back then, March 17th began as a holy day. For centuries, people around the world have celebrated St. Patrick's Day with parades, drinks, and a whole lot of green. We start by having drinks at 8 a.m. Oh, because my ancestors are Irish and it's lots of fun. 10 o'clock, we have more drinks. We have ham sandwiches. <laughs> we have Irish soda bread. It's a religious holiday for me. Oh, you don't like it? Although St. Patrick's Day has become widely secularized over the centuries, it originally began as a holy day. The origin of St. Patrick's Day would be the death day of the saint, the day of his entry into heaven, his feast day, the festival of that. Feast days were annual celebrations in which Christians remembered their chosen saints. It is the liturgical veneration of the death of that person, the memory of what he did, it's associated with the places that he visited, founded, allegedly or otherwise. Patrick's feast day was first observed locally by his own followers in Ireland. They kept his memory alive. They're the people who preserved his writings. And the one thing any ancient group of Christians do about their leader is they preserve the day of death and we can be pretty sure that he died on the 17th of March, and they would have kept that loyally. By the seventh century, Patrick's story had been embellished by several biographers, and he was made a saint by popular devotion. Once Patrick is transformed, that feast day becomes not just the feast day of his own little group, but becomes a feast day throughout the whole of Ireland, and within a couple of generations is being celebrated right across the Latin church. In 1631, Pope Urban VIII added the feast day to the official calendar of the Roman Catholic Church. After that, the 17th of March also became a civic occasion that was celebrated with shamrocks, green clothing, and local fairs. The parades we see today are not actually something that um, started in Ireland, but rather something that started in the US. The earliest recorded St. Patrick's Day parade was in New York in 1766, 10 years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The day of St. Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, was ushered in at dawn with fifes and drums which produced a very agreeable harmony before the doors of many gentlemen of the nation and others. Some scholars believe that these celebrations of Irish identity were actually encouraged by the British Army, 
looking to recruit Irish Americans. It becomes a big holiday when suddenly markers of distinctive Irish identity become necessary. And Patrick is a suitable marker because he's a saint, it brings in religion, it's not political, and so it's a suitable day for Irish in America to have an identity day. Over the next two centuries, St. Patrick's Day evolved into a holiday celebrated by people of all cultures. People like things, places, and dates which will foster memory. Having days we hold in common allows us to, in a very nice and safe way, say, I'm different to you, and yet we can have a party and you and I are somehow linked together. It's that spirit of unity that has drawn people from all walks of life to celebrate this holiday for more than 250 years. We stand on the shoulders of all of those who came before us, and our responsibility is to maintain and improve where we can. But we also have to remain faithful to our mission, which is celebrating Irish faith, heritage, and culture. It's important to realize as well that St. Patrick himself would remind us of what his story is really about, the importance of Christian faith and how national identity is transcended in the universal family of the church. You need to understand the true story of St. Patrick. A lot of people don't know he's not Irish at all. He's actually English. And he was carried into Ireland as a slave and as a slave discovered this incredible relationship with God. He was raised Christian in England, but it was through slavery that he really had his faith te tested. And from that, he was miraculously guided to liberty and he got away and got back to England, became a bishop, and then God called him back and said, yes, I want you to go back to the same people that enslaved you and preach the good news. Through that, the whole country was converted. It's an amazing story. It's a God story. And you can discover much more about the true story of St. Patrick. To activate instant streaming access to the CBN film, I Am Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, you can have it for your gift of any dollar amount. You can get 4K instant streaming access today on St. Patrick's Day. And then we'll send you a copy of the DVD. You'll get it right at your home. On the DVD, there are bonus segments featuring interviews with the actors, an exclusive look at behind the, behind the scenes of the making of the film. Your gift will also go, go towards helping CBN produce new films that highlight historical figures and illuminate the Word of God. Right now, we're working on oracles of God. How did we get the Bible? How did we get the Old Testament? How do we get the New Testament? How do we know that these words are true and historical? And the Bible we read today is the same Bible Jesus and his disciples were reading 2,000 years ago. To get your DVD copy of I Am Patrick, then instant 4K streaming access, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to IamPatrick.com, or just text the word Patrick to 71777. Do it now. Let's celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Following recent revivals on college campuses, Christian singer Michael W. Smith says he believes God is on the move, telling ChristianHeadlines.com he could be wrong, but, quote, I think what we've prayed for for so long is actually happening, continuing to say there's this resurgence of faith. Smith recently performed in Vietnam and said he also sees signs of a global spiritual resurgence. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is providing relief, disaster relief rather, around the world. When a powerful cyclone blasted coastal communities in Indonesia, it tore apart homes, ruined boats, and washed away the entire seaweed harvest. Many people lost their livelihoods. A local village church committed to pray every week until those jobs were restored. Operation Blessing reached out to answer those prayers, providing a canoe, seaweed seeds, and more help to help uh, some of the local families work again and care for their children. And a grateful seaweed farmer, Triana, 
Praise God for Operation Blessing's help. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. When the housing market crashed, Steve and his wife fell deep in debt. Even if they sold all their properties, they would still be in the red and facing foreclosure on their home. The couple say they were in a tailspin, and here's how they pulled themselves out. Prop clear? Wow. It's like actually you're like 10,000 feet closer to God, you know? <laughs> a computer consultant, Steve Byers enjoyed his side business of buying and selling planes. He and his wife, Sherry, also invested in multiple rental properties. Things were going well. That encouraged us to stretch a little bit, and we were looking for real estate here in Florida. Then we came across this one. Wow, that's my dream. I love flying, and this one has a hangar in the backyard and a runway. That was a real blessing. I feel like God provided in that way. Yeah, we were prospering. Things changed when the housing market crashed. And then we realized the pains of borrowing. And when we had to sell a property and it was worth $200,000 less than we paid for it, we really went into a tailspin. I can see the numbers. It's very clear on the computer that we're going to be in the red. Even if we sold all our houses, it wouldn't solve our problem. We're so far in debt. Creditors began calling in their loans. Now they faced foreclosure on another property and wondered if their own home would be next. Steve decided to call CBN to ask for prayer. They pick up the phone, he could feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Barely able to tell him the situation. And uh, they said, well, let us pray for you. And that just really invited God in and he just said, he just heard that, that quiet voice that says, be still and know that I am God and watch what I'm going to do. Steve and Sherry worked hard to keep food on the table, including starting a honey farm. They put everything they could into paying their debt. It came down to rolling quarters sometimes. We've got chickens to lay eggs because I figured if it gets any worse, at least we'll be able to feed the kids eggs from the chickens that we have. Despite the financial struggle, they felt it was important to tithe and give to Christian ministries. They became CBN partners in 2008. One of the promises that I held on to is Malachi 3.10. See if I don't open up the windows of heaven so much so that you won't be able to contain the blessing. As we continued to tithe, it seemed like we would get a check come in just at the right time. Something would always happen at the right time to turn it around and we always had enough. Steve held on to the promise in Malachi, and they continued to tithe. In 2014, Steve and Sherry decided to increase their giving little by little. The New Year's resolution was we're going to start at 10% and each month go to another 11, 12, 13, 14%. I think we got up to 15%. And that year in June, the floodgates were open. I mean, it was awesome. We were able to settle the foreclosure, um, resolve another foreclosure. One of those victories came when a friend offered to help Steve buy a plane. Steve had left computer consulting to work as an independent insurance adjuster. The plane allowed Steve to fly into areas in Florida, devastated by Hurricanes Irma and Michael, helping people with their insurance claims. What would normally take a person 11 hours to get to this area, and I can fly in there in two hours, People can't get in there to help because all the roads are blocked off. I can fly into ground zero. Now the buyers are debt free and have settled their foreclosures. Steve still enjoys buying and selling airplanes. They used their beehives to start a successful business called Bee Healthy Honey and the official beekeepers for President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort. And they're still giving to CBN. I like giving to CBN because they're so accountable. Operation Blessing, it's exciting to see them go in and help when there's a disaster. Superbook has been a great encouragement. It actually surprises me how much I get out of it. They're also thankful for God's faithfulness. We're just stewards of His kingdom, and He owns it all. I want people to understand that, that the Lord provides. So if you have a need, lay it out before Him. Say, Lord, uh, this is a need, you know, and He will provide. He always provides. He always provides for his children. And then he wants to give you an abundance.
The promise is true because God watches over his word to perform it. Test me in this and prove me now if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you cannot contain. And then he adds to it, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I will keep the things that are robbing you away from you. As I pour out a blessing over you, you cannot contain. It's wonderful what happens when you take God at his word and say, okay, I'm going to do it your way. It's counterintuitive. Most of us think, okay, well, when I make enough money, then I'll, I'll, I'll give or I'll help other people. But when you make it at the beginning, give, and it will be given unto you. When you understand I'm putting principles of the universe into play, laws that God has set down that he will honor and, and honor his word over me. When you say, I'll do it his way, that's when the blessings come. If you want to start a life of giving, this isn't an on-again, off-again thing. It certainly isn't a get-rich-quick thing. You just saw in Steve's story, it's not quick, but it's through that consistent giving and that consistent honoring God with your first fruits that the blessings come. They will come because God honors his word. If you want to start doing that, give us a call and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you want to give more. So we've got 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. You can also join 2,500 Club, 2,500 a year. Founder, $5,000. And then Chairman Circle, 10,000 or more a year. At whatever level you join, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. And when you call 1-800-700-7000, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. When you give monthly on the internet on CBN.com, you automatically sign up for it. When you text to give, text the letter CBN to 7177. Again, you automatically sign up for it. And we'll send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, Ask for Pledge Express when you call. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Well, let's be honest. Nobody likes to wait. Not in the doctor's office, not in a checkout line, and especially not in a plane on the tarmac. Sometimes the most difficult kind of waiting is waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. Just ask this young woman named Melissa who grew up on the coast of South Africa. As a child, I had the privilege of spending a lot of time at the ocean. I've always felt very close to God here. When I was a little girl, I remember this time when my father and I went swimming. It was at a natural tidal pool, and that day there was no one else in the water. And the water was pretty rough. It's like these deep ocean waves that come crashing into these natural rocks and then they flood out again. And I was standing at the ledge looking at him, and he opened his arms and told me to jump. And when my father tells me to jump, I jump. He didn't actually think I would. I jumped in and that water was rough. He fought to get both of us out of that water, but he did and it all was fine. And the other day I was standing there getting ready to swim again, but the water was really cold and I started thinking of all the waves and the cold and I was overthinking it so much that it took me a really long time to jump in and swim. And when I was younger, I didn't have all of these thoughts in my mind. There's been times when God told me to jump and to take big steps of faith. And I took them without any fear, without really thinking about it, because I trusted him and I knew that his heart for me was good and that he had big plans and purposes for my life. And I've gone through seasons where there's been a lot of uncertainty and change and what I thought my life would look like is nothing what it looks like today. And it really disconnected me from being present in the season that I'm in. I became disconnected from God and from the people that I love. And in my mind, I was always in the future. There's this prophecy in Hosea where God says, Behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord.
When God led the Israelites out of Egypt into the desert, they were headed for the promised land, but He led them to the desert to draw them nearer to Him. And they were so focused on what they didn't have and of just being in the desert that they didn't realize God's provision for them in that season. He gave them a cloud to cover the sun in the heat of the day. He gave them fire in the cold of the night. He gave them food, He gave them water, He gave them everything they needed so that they could connect with Him. And when the time came for the Israelites to actually enter into the promised land, they heard of the giants and they heard of the obstacles that they had to overcome and they forgot what God has already done for them. They forgot that He protected them from the plagues and the pestilences in Egypt. They forgot that God opened the Red Sea for them. They forgot to trust. You know, as I realized this, it's like in a moment, a light went on in my head. That sense of trust that I had when I was a child and my father said, jump. I need to get back to that place where I trust my father again. I can so clearly see his faithfulness. I realized I can still trust God, even though I don't know what my promised land looks like or what the future holds, I know that I can trust God. And when He says jump, I can jump. If you feel like you're in a desert season and you just can't see the promised land and you can't see the promises that God has for you, I pray that He will open your eyes to show you the blessings that you do have. And you don't have to wait to enter into those promises, to walk in everything that God has for you. He has joy for you. He has provision for you. He is with you. He loves you. He delights Himself in you. He says, trust me. I pray that you will fully comprehend and know the love that God has for you. Because when you fully know that love, you can fully trust. And when you can fully trust, you can live that life that He has planned for you. Such a beautiful story. I just want to thank Melissa for just doing that and really sharing her heart when it comes to waiting. And so many of us might be in waiting seasons. Are you waiting for that healing to come? Are you waiting for that promise, that promise that you have believed in for so long? You're waiting for that promise to be fulfilled no matter what it is. You're waiting for a relationship. You're waiting for an answered prayer. I'm just reminded of Psalm 23. It states that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And though you and I might not have these very tangible enemies, whether it's a person or a situation, but it's a reminder for all of us in a season of waiting, even in the waiting and the trial and the storms of our life where we might feel hopeless and forsaken, God is with us so much so that he's with us. He's prepared a table for you, for you to dine with him, to enjoy him. And so, so many times when we're in a season of waiting, we can focus so much on the future. We can focus so much on, okay, God, when am I gonna get out of this season? I wanna be out of this season of waiting, please. Okay, what, what's next, Lord? Can you, can you help me out? Can we, can we get to that promised land? And in reality, God's like, can you just sit with me? Can you dine with me at this table that I've prepared for you? Because all I want is you. And I want you to realize that I have good things for you, even in this season of waiting for my promise to be fulfilled in your life. And I just want to encourage you today, friends, dine with the Lord, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is faithful, even in a season of waiting, even in that season where you're experiencing grief and longing, you can also experience joy unspeakable because God is with you and he has never forsaken you. Taste and see that the Lord is good today. He wants to show forth his faithfulness. He wants to give you good gifts, even in this season right now, because he's a good father. He's not holding things back from you. Remember, he's got a plan and a purpose for you. 
plans to, to prosper you, not to harm you. So remember that today. And I just want to pray for anyone who's in a season of waiting. I'm right there with you. God sees you and he loves you. And I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit would just encourage your heart right now. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for my brothers and sisters, Lord, who may be in a season of waiting. God, you are with them. And even right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you just reveal yourself to them, God. Reveal things to them, Lord. The good gifts, the things that are beautiful, even right now in this season, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we can bank on your faithfulness. Even when we don't see our answered prayer, we can stand firm with you. With you, our cup runs over. You are the portion of our lives. Thank you so much, Father God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your plans and your purposes. And Father, I just ask and pray and believe that you will answer their prayers and you will give them the desires of their heart. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray all this. Amen. And amen. And if you guys need continued prayer for this or anything else at all, please give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. We've got some awesome prayer warriors who just want to come alongside of you and continue to encourage you and speak the name of Jesus over you and your situation. All right. Well, we got some time for email. All right. You ready for this? I'm ready. All right. So this is from John. And he says, hi, Gordon. I have a 29-year-old daughter and I want her to know Jesus. My ex-wife and I were not religious when our daughters were small. Is there a book from anthropological studies that shows Jesus really existed? Well, John, there's, there's no question that Jesus existed. Uh, none of the ancient writers ever questioned his existence. And there's, uh, here's some specifics. There's Josephus in his Jewish antiquities. He talks specifically about Jesus. That's a first century text outside of the Bible. Tacitus, the famous Roman historian in the annals of imperial Rome, he mentions Jesus. Uh, and then the Jewish Talmud. So uh, that's the, the, the first two are from the first century. The Talmud's probably the third century. Uh, but e even the Jews acknowledge that Jesus is really walked the earth and he, he really existed. There is more evidence for the existence of Jesus than there is for the existence of Socrates. You never hear anyone question, did Socrates actually go around Athens? But uh, now, so for whatever reason, is it fashionable to question uh, did Jesus actually exist? And well, the answer is quite clear. He really did. Okay, well, we got about a minute left. Uh, this is okay. Cynthia. She said, did God say that he was sorry for making man? I think I heard it. I think I heard it was said to Job. I'm not sure. Maybe it was in Exodus. Okay, it's in Genesis. It's in the very beginning. And we used our free will to go far away from God. Uh, and here it is, Genesis 6, 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had met man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. Um, don't, don't grieve God in his heart. Choose wisely. Always choose God. He has plenty of blessings for you. Uh, don't, don't, be a, don't be a grieving child. Here's a word from Isaiah. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint.